Hello and welcome to The Climate Show. And in case you haven't guessed it, I'm Tom Heap. Thrilled to be kicking off this new venture. The whole idea is to infect you with my enthusiasm and excitement for the climate change story. The stakes couldn't be higher. There are twists and turns every day. Heroes, bad guys, and we're all involved. Today's show is taking us to a couple of dusty places. The Chilean desert and, yes, your loft both critical in cutting carbon. I'll also be chewing the fat with one of our experts on the fate of car mechanics and America's climate ambitions, both looking a bit shaky. But first, a quick thought about one of the big stories of this week. The Climate Change Committee told us that the UK government's policies wouldn't deliver carbon cuts required. At present, the two weakest areas, home energy saving, and we will be having a look at that later on. But another one was emissions from land farming and the slow pace of tree planting. We'll save the detail on that for a future programme, but a fun fact I couldn't resist just to whet your appetite. The climate warming emissions from degrading peat, yep, that's all that marshy, soily stuff, are about the same as what comes from all our trucks chugging up and down the road. So bogs matter, well, to me, anyway. Now, let's have a look at some nice, clean numbers. What kept the lights on and the cars charged this week? Well, if you combine the low carbon sources, renewables, nuclear and biomass, you get to a healthy looking 57%, well over half, and that's actually about average for the whole of last year. Now, I love this stuff. I've even been known to take a quick look at the National Grid's data dashboard when the wind is howling round my house. And all this electrification is key to a low carbon future, but it will reshape our economy and the very earth itself. And our economics editor, Ed Conway, has been to where that's happening, the Atacama Desert between Chile, Argentina and Bolivia. He visited the mining region of Antofagasta, home to the world's largest reserve of lithium. The Atacama Desert, a place of haunting beauty, of animals living in fragile harmony with their surroundings in a desert where it hardly ever rains. And here in its heart is the Salar de Atacama, a vast salt flat underneath which are the biggest reserves of lithium in the world. As we try to eliminate fossil fuels and stem our reliance on producers like Russia, we will need millions more tonnes of what they are pumping and evaporating out of this salt flat. Wow, it's really yellow. Oh, it's very yellow-green, yeah. very concentrated, very... If you had the chance to touch it, it's uh, oily. OK. So it's, it looks like, it tastes, it feels like oil, because it's so... Um, the viscosity is so high. Corrado works for SQM, a company pumping and then processing this lithium into battery materials. It's funny, isn't it, to think that one of the most advanced forms of technology these days, rechargeable, state-of-the-art batteries, begin their life with that glugging noise over there as that concentrated brine solution is pumped through from that pond over to this one. Look, you can see it coming out there. Now, that is about 25% lithium Chloride. That is going to go into your smartphone battery or your electric car. It's a special place, this place, then. Oh, definitely, yes. These are the special conditions for the solar to form. These mountains, falls, volcanic rocks, water, and perfect condition for evaporation, so arid places. In the arid hills and villages above the Salar, where water and money are scarce, locals warn of the consequences of lithium mining. Sino que ahí llega la minería haciendo toda la invasión que tienen que hacer y se sacan el agua y se lo han tomado sus derechos de agua, lo han inscrito sus derechos de agua, como diciendo esto es mío, esto es propio. Eso es lo que molesta, porque nosotros estuvimos primero acá en este territorio. And concerns about lithium and copper mining, Chile also has the world's biggest copper reserves, have now caught the ear of this country's new government. It wants to set up a state lithium company and to introduce tougher rules protecting the environment and local communities. Que si es que no hacemos esto de adecuar nuestras instituciones, adecuar los requerimientos, adecuar los estándares ambientales a lo que la propia sociedad está demandando hoy, 
eh, sería muy difícil mantener la actividad minera en el largo plazo. In the port town of Antofagasta, where those resources are transported, it is clear that alongside the mineral riches is severe poverty. Another reason why the government is talking about doing things differently, including adopting a new constitution. For one of its authors, change is needed. There have been a, a decrease in, in flamingo population in the, in the last 10 years. A circa of 12% of the flamingo population have decreased. It's impossible to live without mining. We need materials, of course, but the scale is huge and it's affecting a long term our ecosystems. As the world rushes towards net zero, replacing fossil fuels with wind and solar power, the demand for the minerals they have in this country will only intensify. But so too will the compromises in what is fast becoming a new age of mineral exploitation. Ed Conway, Sky News in Chile. Well, Sky's economics and data editor Ed Conway joins me now. Ed, stunning film, great story, but you also covered another critical element, copper, vital to our electronics revolution. What's the story there? Yeah, it's incredibly important. Actually, I should say, by the way, I, I'm in South Wales. I'm no longer in Chile. I'm in the exact opposite when it comes to, to rainfall. Uh, but actually, incidentally, this used to be a big area for, for copper smelting here, although I'm, I'm working on a different story on uh, right now. You'll be able to see that next week. Copper is incredibly important. It's incredible right, uh, incredibly important right now for our lives. You know, we use it in electrics, we use it in piping. But as that green revolution takes place, the demand for it is just going to go even higher. Potentially, some people estimate up to four to nine times as much copper needed for green energy as it is right now. So a massive increase. And that's because, you know, when you look uh, at the various different devices we're using right now, well, we want to use more of them. We want to electrify the world. That is the same uh, as eliminating our reliance on fossil fuels. So we need much more copper. And the vast majority of the world's copper, at least in terms of reserves, is in Chile. Now, a little fact that I dug up is that an electric car has close to my body weight in copper inside, 86 kilos. Why so much? I mean, it's partly it's because of all of those different electric contraptions that go within the car. Think about a motor. You know, an electric motor has a lot of copper in it just in the windings to, to make it go round. Uh, and then you've got all of the different wires taking uh, the charge from the batteries through to the, uh, to the motors. But by the same token, you know, like I say, we have lots of copper in our lives right now, but we don't really think about it much. There's still quite a lot in a, a normal conventional car right now. But that just goes through the roof when it comes yeah. to electric cars. We mentioned copper in our lives right now, and a, and a thought struck me about, actually about recycling. That, and I'm going to bring something in that came from my house here. Thank you very much, Andrew. This is a, a copper pipe that came uh, from my house when I took out the central heating system. Now, in theory, a lot of people are going to be doing this in the next few years. So can recycling our existing copper help us in any way? Yeah, potentially, we need to do more recycling of copper. We don't actually recycle as much copper as we could. And as you say, there's a lot of copper in our lives that could be turned from pipes into wires, but getting there is going to be a big job. It's about encouraging people to do more recycling, and that's something I think we could all do a lot more of. Thanks a lot, Ed. And you can see a longer version of Ed's extraordinary film on our website, app or on YouTube. We would, of course, need less electricity and energy more widely if we didn't waste so much. And this week, the independent official advisers on climate policy, that's the Climate Change Committee, said the government wasn't doing nearly enough at the moment to drive energy saving. 20% of our carbon emissions come from the building sector and the vast majority of that from our homes. They are leaky. Uh, putting that right nationally would cost many billions soon but save many billions later. And who is going to do all the work? I've been to Stockport. This, quite obviously, is a loft, and it's at the sharp end of all the talk we've heard this week about energy saving. It's where heat vanishes through the roof. It's where your bills can also go and the advisers to the government on climate change, well, frankly, they hit the roof, saying that the lack of policy over this was a shocking gap. Also with me in the loft is Mark Cox, who's busy laying some insulation. Um, Mark, there seems to be insulation already here, so why more? 
it's not in a great condition so we're currently topping up the insulation to 400 millimeters hopefully this will keep the heat in the house the bills down and provide a better environment well can you give me a bit of a guided tour of some of the other things you're doing in here we've installed triple glazing windows within the property so it helps keep the heat in we put external wall insulation. I can't see that. Well... <laughs> so, so, so the insulation is behind this rendered finish. You should save £200 a year on your energy bills. £200 a year? Just from the external wall? Yeah, just from this rear external wall up to £200 a year. For the average UK homeowner, a deep retrofit like this could cost upwards of £20,000. The good news is your bills will drop rapidly. But in order to retrofit all the UK's ageing houses, we're going to need a huge skilled workforce that simply doesn't exist at the moment. I was doing joinery, plastering, plumbing, a, bit, a little bit of everything. And they asked for me, actually, because I'm quite into eco stuff. We're basically making the families pay less once they move in. If this actually works and they get everything done by the time scales, like 2035 would be a massive help. In order to meet the government's net zero targets, the number of qualified retrofit builders needs to at least double over the next five years alone. Looks like the boss is here. There's an understanding that we have to decarbonise every single building. My question is, who is going to do that? We have a complete absence of skills that has been building up over 25 years within the construction industry. Aliens Company is training workers on the job. They're paid the living wage as they train, and they're all local. If you decided, OK, I'm really going to invest in this work in my home, the thing you'd want next is a person you can trust to deliver it. Those are the people we don't now have enough of. Training on-site has stopped. Full apprentices have stopped for at least the last 20 years. A job placement is not fully trained. A short-term college course is not fully trained. The training needs to happen in a house. So I've worked in housing since I was 19, my first ever job, and I've been here ever since. And I think the reason being, you actually make a difference to people's lives. John is leading Stockport Homes' retrofit revolution. They want to upgrade all 12,000 of their homes. If you look at the housing stock across this country, in 20, 30, 40 years' time, the housing stock that's here now will be there then. If we don't tackle it now, we'll never get to the targets which we need to achieve. For me, it is sexy because it's really vital that we do it now. It's a challenge, but it's a challenge that as a housing sector we're certainly up for. We're about to take a short break, but first, the UK is one of the worst offenders in Europe for what's called e-waste. That's all the electronic gadgets we've used and then thrown away. This is the rather shameful picture of the discarded wires in my shed. Now, I have a question. How many electric cables do you think the UK is hoarding on those shelves and in those drawers? I'll have an answer for you after the break. Welcome back to The Climate Show with me, Tom Heap. And before the break, I asked how many electric cables are we hoarding? The answer, 140 million. And that, in case you were wondering, is enough to go round the earth five times. Now, it's been a busy week in climate news, and I'm glad to say that with me here to discuss a couple of the stories is our science and technology editor, Tom Clark. Tom, welcome. Now, we heard a lot from the Climate Change Committee this week, big headlines, criticising the government. But you've spotted something a little less well-known. Yeah, something that jumped out at me. The, the automotive industry warning that 22,000 jobs could be at risk across the auto sector as we switch from internal combustion engine cars and trucks to electric vehicles. I know, it's a little bit odd. Electric vehicles, though, contain fewer moving parts, so I read. And as a result, they're easier to put together, so fewer jobs, fewer jobs needed on the assembly line, and also much smaller supply chains, and there are lots and lots of jobs making parts for cars that are, that are powered by combustion engines. Yeah, we always hear when it comes to car manufacturing, it's not just about the big brands that we know. There's a huge supply chain beneath them, and you're saying maybe fewer of them. That's it, and it's a big shock for the auto industry in the way that it's organised, not just in parts and in manufacturing, but also once a car's on the road, 
Well, this is something I was going to ask because I've talked to my local garage about this. You know, they're quite concerned about where the, the jobs are going to be in for the mechanics, for repair. Exactly. Where do they fit in when cars, electric motors, don't break as often and as easily? There are fewer parts to go wrong, and when they do, it's easier to switch them out, so you don't need that, that same... Uh, scale yeah. of repair industry. Well, we've got to be a little bit careful as kind of painting this as bad news. Obviously, it could be for the mechanics, although quite a few are retraining in, in, in maintaining electric cars. But of course, it breaks it. None of us particularly welcome maintenance bills when it comes to our car, do we? I know, for consumers, this is a, this is a, it's definitely a win-win, yeah. but it's another example of how we need to think about these, these big challenges of the, of the transition to a green economy now. Now, something quite different you actually reported on recently, a big deal happening in the USA. That's right, a really significant court case in the US. The US Supreme Court, remember now, it's top-heavy with conservative lawmakers put there by Donald Trump before he left office. They've ruled in a significant court case, and we've got a map here of the 18 coal-producing states in the US, led by West Virginia and two coal companies. They challenged the US Environmental Protection Agency's rights to limit carbon dioxide emissions from power plants. They said the EPA is going beyond the scope of its, uh, of its powers to do that. And no surprise, these are all Republican-dominated, Republican conservative states. And the, the Supreme Court ruled in their favour. The EPA can no longer regulate emissions, so the Biden administration, which has ambitious plans to cut carbon in America, has lost one of its key policy instruments for doing that. But when it comes to America, I'm always told we must be careful about looking, ev looking at everything from Washington. It's often about what's happening at the state level, and quite a few of those are quite pro-climate change, actually. Absolutely, they? and that's a really significant point here. This is about the federal government and federal agencies' ability to restrict that. Look at this map. These are the US states that have their own net zero targets most of them going for net zero by 2050, like the UK and, and, and the US. So they'll have their own rules for cutting carbon, their own plans for power plants and switching to renewables. So there will be progress. Now, quick burst. What positive news have you spotted this week? Not a, great, not a great week, I have to say, for positive news. But one thing that caught my eye, in the context of that Supreme Court ruling in the US, Australia, which has also been really dragging its feet on climate, they've just set a emissions trading scheme for its industry to try and reduce emissions there, something they abandoned a decade ago, and they've also toughened up their uh, commitment to cut carbon on the international stage. Well, the little one I spotted was uh, the company that does a direct air capture that's pulling carbon dioxide straight out of the air has got plans for a new plant. Now, I know it's far from the panacea answer, but, you know, it's always and rather than or when it comes to climate change solutions, I think. Tom Clark, thank you very much indeed. Thanks for having me. Now, you'll find our content on every platform, TV, digital and social media. And we've been asking you for your questions all week. So now we're going to try and answer a few. Bridget asks, is wood, that's biomass, truly carbon neutral and sustainable over time, enough to use in power stations? Well, for an answer to that, who better to ask than our climate change and energy correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter. Biomass is considered the UK's second largest source of renewable energy after wind, but there's a big debate over whether it should be called renewable at all. Those who say it is point to the fact that you can regrow trees. That makes it inherently sustainable and renewable. But there are lots of critics of biomass energy. They say that when you burn wood, it releases carbon. They say that replanting schemes can take decades to come to fruition. The British government considers biomass energy a vital part of the energy mix and a critical part of hitting net zero carbon emissions targets by 2050. But it is funding a scheme to increase production of more sustainable biomass energies in the UK, including algae and seaweed. And Scott sent in this question. How does the UK's climate strategy have a global impact when countries like China are so massively polluting? Well, Scott, I need, think we need to be a little bit careful about always putting China in the naughty seat here. They are the huge developers of renewables, wind and solar, up there in the top countries in the world. Uh, secondly, it helps to lead by example. We saw a bit of that last year with the climate change talks in Glasgow. The fact that we could at least talk a good game here in the UK did help, I think, to bring others along. Finally, there's a sort of moral question. Just because someone else is doing something bad, robbing a bank, <laughs> is it right for you to do it as well? And Jordan sent in this. 
how can I know that my financial services, banks, mortgages and insurance, are investing my money ethically? Uh, money not really my field, so we've asked an expert, Timmy Merriman-Johnson, for an answer. Hi, Jordan. Thank you very much for the question. A simple way to find out how ethical the financial services you're using are is to visit the Ethical Banks and Building Society's rating table by the Good Shopping Guide. This table lists the main banks and building societies in the UK, giving them an ethical index score out of 100 and a red, amber or green rating. If you want to find out how ethical your pension is, assuming you're paying into a workplace pension, there's every likelihood you're paying into a default pension plan, particularly if you've been auto-enrolled into one. You can actually change your pension from a default to an ethical plan by logging into your pension platform if you have the details. Your HR department should be able to help you with this. Well, that's just a flavour of the questions you sent in. So what else do you want to know? If you scan the QR code on your screen right now, you can send your questions directly to us or follow us on your favourite social media platform, add your question in the comments and we'll find them and, of course, try to answer them. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for joining me on my first weekend show. Now, if you've got a spare moment before next week's episode, why not nip up in your loft and check your lagging? Bye. <laughs>